Happy Wednesday, my friend. It is so good to see you on this lovely start to November. I hope everybody had a super fun Halloween, if that's what you celebrate. And if it is, I hope that you had more treats than you did tricks. I know I've left with so many treats. I need to get rid of more treats. So <laughs> we need to get the treats out of the house, but I hope you had an amazing time. I want to say a big hello to everybody joining us from all over the place. Giacomo, Lane, Ryan, Jeff, oh, Kelly, it's so good to see everybody. If you're new here, welcome. We're a super fun bunch. We get together every single week at 1 p.m. Eastern to trade tips, tactics, things that are working, and we do that with really smart people. So it's kind of a, it's a, it's a two for one special. I love it. So if you haven't already say hi in the chat, that's kind of where the party takes place. The majority of the time we are a welcoming bunch and we would love to get to know you. Maybe let us know where you're coming in from. Perhaps what is in your cup? I've got some green tea today, but I'd love to know what you're having. So it can feel like we are cozying up together. Like I said, we come here every single Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, but if you're joining for the first time today, this is not normal. What you're about to experience is not normal because we decided, I don't know, it's the end of the year. We're getting a little spicy. I don't know what it is, but we decided to mix things up today and bring back one of my dear, dear friends, Jenny Blake. You might have caught a horror episode uh, a few months ago. If not, we will drop that link in the chat. You can check it out. It's amazing. And we thought, why not have Jenny back and really sort of flip the script? I'm going to ask her some questions. She's going to ask me some questions. And you know what we're also going to do? We're going to ask you some questions. I know you thought you were just going to get to sit back and relax and not participate wrong. We are participating. You are participating. So we're going to be asking you some questions too. Hence why the chat is sort of the place to be and kind of the most important part of this. So please help me in welcoming wherever you are, Jenny, to join us. Hey, thank you so much. Glad to be back, Kim, because what's better than coffee with Kim? I mean, that's what we're all here for. <laughs> It's kind of fun to have like, it's almost like, like, like a co-host, like we're doing yes. like co-hosting duties. I love this. We got to have IRL coffee. I felt like I was living the dream because I had IRL coffee with Kim in New York. She came in for a whirlwind trip and there were so many questions that I had lingering from our conversation that I asked her, can we flip the mic? And I bet your community would be so interested too in some of the things that you tease on your website. Like why Shark Tank isn't always what it seems and how that might tie into the creator economy that we're all grappling with how to thrive into this day. Exactly. And I know everybody here is so excited, Kelly included, that you are here with us, Jenny, because you are a wealth of information. And I want to make sure that everybody knows because I have been recommending it left and right. But that lovely, lovely book that you see sitting next to Jenny is not just beautiful decoration. It's not just artwork. That is her book, people. That's her <laughs> brand spanking new book that is jam packed full of tips and tactics that I have been using ever since I read it. And I've been recommending it to everybody. So I want to make sure that we, we had to address that. It had to get talked about. That is amazing. Thank you so much. Well, it is consistent with so much of what you do. Even, even the fact that after each one of these sessions, you say, steal my notes or copy my homework, because the whole point of free time is it's not just what we do for fun, but it's free time as a skill. How do we get better at building that muscle of freeing our time to do more and more of our best work? And I would say to the theme of today's conversation, the creator economy, how do we free our time from the minutia and the busy work and the boring stuff that we have to do, adulting, to do more of our biggest and best contribution for the creator economy? Absolutely. And I think that that's one thing that we we get stuck in the shoulds. I should be doing this. I, I should instead of the wants, what do I actually want to be doing? What do I want to be focused on? And I know you've had those days, I've had those days where you start off the day and you're so excited and you have like three or four things on your to-do list and you're like, I got this. And then somehow the day goes into chaos. You end the day and the same three or four things are on your list. And you're like, 
I was busy all day and yet none of the work that I wanted to do got done. So that I think is one of the things that I've been working really hard on and your book helped with so much to kind of get rid of those days or at least maybe not get rid of them totally, but lessen them as much as possible. Totally. I think of calendar design now like a puzzle or one of my favorite games, Tetris. I don't know if anyone's played the new Tetris effect, but it's pretty incredible. It's the only video game that I actually enjoy. And the creators designed it to put you in a flow state. So this combination of problem solving, try to fit the pieces. It's challenging because it goes at a certain speed, but then they've also put it to this like EDM music backdrop with really cool visuals. <laughs> and I think that time design can be like that. It doesn't have to, we don't just have to be at the mercy of a chaotic, cluttered, time confetti filled calendar. We can, if with just a little bit of intentionality, I do think that there are very practical things each of us can do to design our time, even starting now. Sometimes I'll notice what holidays are coming up. And not only do I put a do not schedule block, let's say for the day before and after an upcoming holiday, I set that to recur annually so that I never have to think of it again. And then lo and behold, next year when that holiday rolls around, I go, oh, cool. I already don't have any meetings because I already had put this recurring block. And that's an example of not just being more efficient to get more done. That's not really the goal. It's that what steps can you take today that you'll never have to think of again that will continue freeing your time into the future? I did two things immediately after reading the, I mean, I did many things after reading your book, but two of the things, you know, when it comes to like calendar construction, and I'm curious if, you know, Jeff and Gracie and Elsa and anybody else here have sort of calendar tactics that they want to share that we can feature in the chat. But two of the things that I have started doing is I have a no meeting Monday. I do no meetings, no phone calls on Monday. Now, I work in client services. So I know some people work at corporations, some people are entrepreneurs, some people run product businesses, some people work. So as a service-based business owner, does that rule sometimes get bent? Of course, if there's an emergency and a client is calling, you know, I have to pick up the phone. I can't be like, well, sorry, Jim, it's Monday. <laughs> I would have no clients. So, but for the most part, I will say my clients are starting to understand because I'm honest. I say like, hey, using the example of Jim, hey, Jim, would love to talk to you next week. I'm not doing any meetings on Monday, but here are my availabilities on Tuesday and Wednesday. And after a while, that might take a couple of times, but then Jim starts to absorb, okay, it's Monday. I know Kim's not going to meet with me. You know, so so it kind of, it, it's a little bit like training a puppy, if you will. I'm kind of teaching people. It's it's no meeting Monday. So that was one of, one of the first things I implemented really soon after reading your book. And the second thing that I implemented that, that sort of is around meeting structure and calendars was that I decided that sort of as the, the pendulum to Monday, no meeting Monday, I was going to do fun Fridays. So all of my fun meetings, and you guys know about fun meetings because it's like, Oh, Jenny has a friend, Sarah, that she wants you to meet. I don't know Sarah, but the fact that Jenny is introducing me to Sarah, Sarah must be pretty fun, pretty cool. Or, hey, somebody's in Austin and they want to meet up for coffee with me. All of that gets moved to Friday, if possible. You know, again, I know that sometimes scheduling can be tough if people are only in town for one day or whatnot. But all of my fun meetings or fun calls or fun intros or things like that all get stacked on Friday. So that I'm curious for you though, Jenny, if you have some like, I mean, I know you have many rules when it comes to your calendar, but if you have similar, like one or two similar type rules that you follow. Definitely. And like you, I make exceptions, but that's the point. The point is to make those exceptions very intentionally and for just the right things. But it's so rewarding when a fun Friday rolls along. I also don't schedule meetings on Friday and I can spontaneously say yes to a lunch invitation or do sometimes I'll go into a really deep work pocket and I'll go, oh, cool. I didn't even expect to be this productive today, but because I didn't have any meetings on my calendar, I was able to do that. So um, I, I don't even tell people what my parameters are. I mean, now they're very transparent because they're in the book. But even in the past, I never really said to clients, because sometimes I'm working with speaking clients, they're paying me a lot of money. I don't even say I'm not available on Mondays. I just say that day doesn't work. How about Tuesday or Thursday? And 
whether they're using a scheduling tool, I use Calendly for that, or I'm booking or someone on my team. We just have all these parameters that are clearly defined, like ideally a 30 minute buffer between every call. Cause I hate the feeling of skidding from one into the next. <sighs> ideally no calls before 10 AM. Although usually I prefer 11 AM. And then as I once had a coaching client say to me around 3 PM, I don't even know my own name. So it's yeah. to nobody's benefit to meet with me after about two or three in the afternoon. It's just nobody wins. And even when I was doing coaching, in the early days, I used to feel bad if I didn't accommodate those off hours. But then I realized they're getting me at like 60% capacity because my brain, my creative energy just isn't very good at that time. So that helps me bolster the buffer, the time buffer and the boundaries that I have in my calendar, because I really do want the meetings and calls that I have or podcast interviews or things like this to be when I'm at my best. A hundred percent. And that's going to be different for everybody. You know, I'm a morning person, but I have friends that are deeply, deeply, deeply night owls. And like they hit three o'clock and they're like in their stride. And then like after dinner, they're even more in their stride, whereas I'm like completely brain dead. So I will also say, you know, it's a little bit of like everyone's answer is going to be different. You just have to kind of play around and see what's going to make the most sense for you because it really is, you're totally right. It really is about optimizing when do you work the best and how do you protect that time to do the big important goals. And it kind of goes into Ari's question that I want us to tackle together here, which is really about information systems and storing systems. And I have to let you answer this first, because I know that there is one platform and specifically that you use that you talk about in the book. That's just kind of like your end all be all. Oh, yeah. Well, so I call this a collection bucket. There are different terms for this. Some people call it a slip box. There's a German guy who invented a, a method like this. He calls it a Zettelkasten. There's a book called How to Take Smart Notes that will kind of blow your mind. But to answer Ari directly, I use Notion. I have a database called Synthesis, or if I were you, you could just call it Collection Bucket. And that is where all my idea snippets have a home. So whether it's an idea I have while I'm on the go, whether it's an article I've read, a quote, a fact, a story about my day, that's called Homework for Life from a book called Storyworthy. It all goes into this collection bucket. And then what's cool about Notion is you can view that database in different ways. So, and you can also create all the fields you want to label the information that's coming in. So I run two podcasts and I have two newsletters. And so I can tag something as time well spent to add. And then I can also tag it. Is it a quote, a question, a tip or tool? And so when I look at my database in a Kanban style board, that has all these categories in an instant, I can just go, okay, it's time to draft a newsletter. Let me view all of this collection bucket, but I'm going to view by what I have tagged for time well spent. And then I could easily pull from each sort of micro bucket within the broader one of what I need. So the principles behind this, even if you're, if I've lost you are creating something that's easily searchable, that's customizable to the way your mind works, how you like to collect information and interlinkable so that you can link notes to each other and know, oh, okay, this, you know, I use tags a lot in this database. Okay. I tagged this joy flow and free time. And then I can search based on those tags as well. So the key is just, uh, Tiago Forte calls it building a second brain, creating something outside of yourself where every bit of info has a home and creating different views so that you know where to find things when you need them. And I have a loom on this that we could put in the show notes where I actually give yes. you a visual walkthrough. I think those for visual learners like me and Ari, I don't know if you're a visual learner, but I, the loom was extremely helpful because sometimes I need to like see things and how people are using it. But I would say that this was really helpful for me when I started categorizing notes because I don't, this was back in the day, but what I used to be guilty of was sending emails to myself I would send emails to myself at like, you know, 11 p.m. at night that would be like idea, you know, rocket ship. <laughs> and I'd wake up in the morning and go, okay, what was I, 
what train of thought was I on where I just said idea rocket ship? And sometimes I would remember the next day, but oftentimes I'd be like, yeah, I don't know what I was referring to. <laughs> and it would just get deleted because I would, I would sort of like lose that train of thought. So I feel like putting it in categories, whether it's newsletter, whether it's podcast or whatever categories, you know, you might have in your everyday life. I think that's, what's really important is being able to say rocket ship, you know, <laughs> newsletter, and then maybe giving yourself a little bit more context. And sometimes I use a tool called Captio that allows you, it's, like sending yourself an email, but in even fewer clicks. Sometimes I do still fire off a Captio or an email to myself, but then even in your inbox, that data still needs a home so that the next time you want to get on a video or create content for any one of your platforms, it's really hard to find it in email. So it's like, if even if email is the reminder that you need to file this later, it still should ideally go somewhere. And then what I like emails also Yes, it's searchable, but it's just so vast and you can't really distinguish your ideas and notes to self from anyone else's that in a collection bucket, it's already curated. It's already the stuff you might want to refer to in the future. Yeah. Although I have to say, I started using an email tool that I am obsessed with. I started using it about a year ago and I'm in. I'm all in. I've been telling all my friends about it. I actually just got two people on it within the last month. I got separate notes from each of them being like, okay, like you're right. Like now we see what you were talking about. And that is superhuman. Have you ever used superhuman? I've heard of it. And I know friends who are obsessed. I don't love the tracking that they do. So I don't use it, but... I've heard friends who are obsessed. Tell me, why do you love it so much? What is different about any other email app that you've used? I think if I have, okay, I'll give you my top three reasons of why I really love Superhuman. Number one, now a lot of people have this feature, but I'll still say it. Number one, they have templates, which again, I know Google has that plugin now and and a couple other service providers do as well. But I really love the idea of templates. I have like templated no documents where I have to turn down an opportunity because as a people pleaser, I really struggle with saying no. So even just having that template, it's almost like I don't even have to think about it. It auto fills with like the no, and I just have to customize it a little bit. It's helpful for me. So the templates are number one. Number two, I never have to touch my mouse. And I know this sounds so crazy, but as somebody who used to drag things to folders in my Gmail and label things and star things, Everything is now done with shortcuts on the keyboard, which at first I will admit is really intimidating. But then once you get the hang of it, you're like, oh, where was I before this? Like it, this is a thousand times better than, than anything else. And then the third thing that I really, really like about it is again, and I know a lot of people have this now, but I just find it very helpful. I can send myself reminders, not only to send an email back to me like a week later, but I can specifically set a reminder if people don't reply. So a lot of, there used to be a plugin for Gmail. I don't know if it still exists called Boomerang. The problem with Boomerang is it would just send it back even if somebody already replied. So it was coming back in my inbox, even if we had already dealt with it. In Superhuman, I can say, send this back to me, you know, no matter what. Or send this back to me only if nobody on this chain replies and I'm like hunting down somebody for something. So those are my top three things for Superhuman. If anybody is interested in Superhuman, I would say message me. I'm happy to, you have to get like um, an invite. I don't know. It's so lame. But the guy who started it gave me like a link to you. So for anybody I know that wants to get on it. So if you want it, message me and I'll get it for you. But I have to say it's, I know it's probably not, I'm in, I'm in. I hate, I hate, I hate even hearing myself like go on and on and effuse about it, but I, it really is that great. It's so amazing to find a tool like that, that just, I mean, email can be such an Achilles heel, at least for me. So it's very satisfying. I use a lot of those same features. I've just probably strung them together differently through Gmail, (laughs) but. Oh, totally. You asked me about the tools I use to collect content and collect ideas. You have also been creating content publicly out loud 
for such a huge part of your career. I'm wondering, how do you keep your content and idea generation machine fed? What are some of your practices for always having something to say? And, and can you also, to that end, can you also tell us how you define creator economy? Because I do feel that you're such a champion for it. But for a lot of people can often feel like a treadmill. Yeah, I would say for me as someone who tries to create tips and tricks and content and, and things to share with other people, what I have found is actually similar to uh, Kimberly's point that she put in here. And she was asking about, you know, calendaring when it comes to content creation. I have had to set up, by the way, sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. I, it's something I've been testing for about three weeks now. So I'm like mid in the testing phase. You're catching me like in the, the Frankenstein science experiment part. I have started to block off uh, creative time blocks. Now, the reason why I'm a little bit yes and no on that is sometimes when I get into that creative time block, it's great. Things are flowing. I'm like, oh yeah, I gotta, I gotta do a little Instagram reel on superhuman or, oh yeah, I gotta do a, a LinkedIn post all about notion and how much I've been loving it. So sometimes it's really easy. Now, sometimes I will get to, you know, my Thursday 10 AM creative block. And I gotta tell you, Jenny, I'm stuck. Like, even though the time is blocked off in my calendar, there's something, the mojo's not flowing. And then I sometimes psych myself out because I'm like, this is your creative block and you're not being creative. So, so what I've had to do the past three weeks is just kind of say, it's okay. Like, it, it's just not hitting you today for, for one reason or the other. Let's move on to your to-do list or something like that. But I do try, or what I'll do during that time is if it's not immediately hitting me, I will go through notes, going back to your point of that kind of idea bucket, I'll kind of go through old notes that I've written, or sometimes I will save things on social media that other people have posted that are sort of like inspiration. And I'll look at that and say, oh, you know, our mutual friend Vanessa posted this really great thing about being a people pleaser. Like that kind of gives me a little bit of a jump start about a people pleasing you know, tactic or tip. So I would say the, the calendar stuff the past three weeks has been interesting. It doesn't always work, but I have been liking it. So I don't know if you do something different. I know it's sometimes hard to be like creative on demand. It's hard to necessarily schedule creative time because it doesn't always hit you. Well, it's interesting. You mentioned scheduling. The one thing that has made the biggest difference is paying for accountability and here's what I mean. So I've been producing, I've had an online platform where I'm trying to create content for other people for almost 18 years. And the one thing that has worked the best than anything else ever is streaks, not, not wanting to break a streak, but even more so paying for accountability. And what I mean by that is I started paying to go into a production, a podcast production studio here in New York. And what's interesting about it is I pay just enough that it hurts. It hurts if I don't yeah. use that time well. I pay $50 an hour. And of course, that's a privilege in and of itself. But what it gets me to do is batch my content production. So I know that I, I'm much better off if I plan ahead and I kind of have an idea what I want to say. Sometimes I'm brainstorming on the subway on my way into the studio just so that I don't waste time once I'm there. But there have been so many days this year where I don't feel like podcasting at all all. It's raining out. I'm in a yeah. bad mood. I'm groggy. Maybe my husband and I just like got in a weird conversation before I left the house. And it doesn't matter because the studio doesn't let me cancel within 24 hours. So rain or shine, I go, I show up and I want to make the most of that time. And so I realized that paying for space has actually held me much more accountable to myself than I do when I'm at home and the fridge and my dog and my husband are nearby. And then the other part of paying for accountability is I, I went pro. I hired a full service production team before I used to own the life of an episode. Like even if I delegated aspects of it, like audio editing and show notes prep, I, Jenny, was still the one on the hook to move that card on our Notion production board, the life of an episode, to move it across from start to finish. Once I hired this team and I made sure to hire them also at an amount that really hurt in the beginning, like I didn't quite have the funds, didn't know how I was going to justify it. 
now they own the episode and they know to make it live, whether or not I've reviewed the show notes, whether or not I've listened back to the audio. So they know not to stop the train on my behalf if I'm creating a bottleneck. And that has been a huge relief. Just somebody else cares about the production and publishing schedule other than me. And that has allowed me to produce now 12 episodes a month, which is way more than I've ever done in the past seven years. Well, and it reminds me, I mean, as we're coming up on January, it's why everybody gets gym memberships and personal trainers. Like all of a sudden January one hits and we're like, okay, I'm going to get those six pack abs. Like I am going to be able to do a push up uh, because when you pay for something, you're a little bit more motivated to get it done. Or at least for me, I know when I sign up for like an exercise class, if I'm like waffling, but I know that there's a $20 cancellation fee, you know, guess who's showing up? begrudgingly, because I'm not paying a $20 cancellation fee. Like I'm, we're spinning that day or whatever it is that I've signed up for. The other thing that helps me is repurposing content. And this is a known bit of advice, but I think it's easy to forget. So for example, I often will draft the introduction. It's usually a paragraph or two of a show notes for a podcast episode or a conversation like this one. And on days where I am just not feeling it at all in terms of writing a newsletter introduction about what's going on in my life or what I'm thinking about, I just copy paste. I go to the latest podcast episode or a couple back, (laughs) copy paste. That's the newsletter intro. And I figure most people are not even going to notice because how many people read the show, show notes in detail? How many people remember it? Are those same people reading the newsletter? And even if they read the same thing twice, I doubt that they care. So that's helped me in a pinch. And the other thing, this is a tip I learned from my friend, Alan Dibb. He was a guest on free time. If you create a piece of content with an expiration date, like a newsletter, once the newsletter goes out, it's gone. And for 10 years, I don't know why I didn't figure this out sooner. For 10 years, I would create, craft these newsletters with my best tips and tools and quotes. and, And then they would just disappear. And any new readers in my community would never see them. Now, as soon as I send a newsletter, I evergreen it by removing any time dated references and I put it into a welcome sequence. So now when somebody new joins my list for the new folks, I would not have to create a new piece of content for at least six months. And they would still get a message every 10 days with stuff that I genuinely spent time and effort curating. And of course I still send other time-based ones, but that's been a huge help. Go ahead. I feel like that's huge. And it kind of touches on Ari's point here, you know, as somebody who runs multiple newsletters and blogs, as you just referred to what, when you're saying that you're evergreening stuff or you're, you know, putting things that you can copy paste, what program are you doing that in? I keep, of course, in notion, that's where the ideas start out and that's where they start to get organized. I, my whole business backend is powered by Kajabi because that's where I host courses, newsletters, af- my affiliate programs, event registration. It's kind of this all in one platform, but you could, I either draft the newsletter itself in a notion card. I have a content calendar in notion or in Kajabi itself, that, that part's not down to any kind of special science. You could use almost any email management software. How about you, Kim? I use ConvertKit. So ConvertKit has kind of won me over, at least for the time being. I'm always like, if bigger and better comes along, I might jump ship. But I I have had friends who who totally agree with you. And I know that Kajabi is really great because they do offer a lot of things. What was my friend saying? She was basically saying like, yes, are there areas of Kajabi that other programs do better? We were talking about like ConvertKit. She's like, yes, I love the whatever it is, tagging in ConvertKit. And I can't do that in Kajabi. But you know, everything you just said, Kajabi hosts my course, can take my payments. Like she was like all in, it covers more of what I need. So yes, there might be individual wants and needs, but on the whole, it's a better fit. Okay. I have something, this is a a shift in the conversation, but I'm dying to ask you because I don't know where I saw this or learned this about you. I feel that you've made some strategic choices as a creator in that you got called back to the real world, but you said no. And I'm dying to know why. 
And then you did end up making it to Shark Tank. And I just got to get the dish on that before we get back to tools. I'm, I've been meaning to ask you this for months. I feel like you went deep because the real world reference is so deep. I don't even know where that was on the internet, but I, that was you, you went through a lot of clicks to find that one. Um, no, I was in college and I had written in like most kids do when they're like 19, 20, being like, I want to be on the real world. For anybody that doesn't know, um, MTV, which is a channel here in the US, although I do think MTV is global, but maybe not. Uh, it is a show on MTV called The Real World. And what it is, is they put, uh, I think it's seven strangers in a house to see what happens. And they've had it on for like 20 plus, plus years and they pick a new city. So it'll be like The Real World, Paris, The Real World, New York, The Real World, Key West, et cetera. And it's been, it's been on for, I don't even know if it's on anymore. I think they kind of like rebooted it for a while, but I don't know if it's permanently back. But anyways, back in college, I had applied to be on The Real World and uh, I got through like the first layer where they're like, okay, we'd like to meet you in person. And the in-person casting is in Miami, Florida. I was going to school in Gainesville, Florida, which if you look on a map, those things are about six hours apart. And typical college student, we had a big football game that Friday, uh, that Saturday. So Friday was really the day, like all the parties were happening, all like the cool stuff was happening. And they wanted me to drive down to Miami that Friday. And in my sort of like 19 year old mind, it was like, ah, oh, I can't miss all these parties for this opportunity. There's a giant football game on Saturday. So I actually did not go to the in-person callback, which in retrospect, I mean, everything happens for a reason. I, I can't imagine if I had gone on the show. I feel like anytime you go on reality TV, it is either a great experience or awful. And for the rest of your life, you are, you know, put in this category of, of whatever they edited you to be like on reality TV. So maybe it was for the best that I did not go to that Miami. I college. wonder if there was part of you that not just from your school schedule, but I wonder if there was part of you thinking, is this aligned with my brand? Do you think there was any part of you thinking that at that time? Probably. I mean, even back then, if for again, if anybody has watched reality TV, you know that there's like categories of people, right? The girl that cries, hmm. uh, the guy who's shy, um, the girl with, you know, X, Y, Z going been? on. Like, what would have been your thing? I think I probably would have been like typical. It was like University of Florida, big college, like, like, I think that would have been like my slant, like kind of the all American football, you know, college girl would have probably been my slant because it's not like I play an instrument or I'm in a band or, or anything that I could have gone into like the artsy category. But I think that's probably what mine would have been. If I had to guess. You say that reality TV, uh, sometimes they use the word reality loosely. Can you take us behind the scenes of the Shark Tank pitch, both how you prepared, because today's topic is tools, tips and tools. Yes. So were there any tips and tools in preparing for basically what probably at the time felt like the pitch of your life? And then what is not always what it seems? Because you alluded to that. Yeah, no, I think preparing... I love that you asked about preparing for Shark Tank because I feel like everybody wants to talk about the show and what was Mr. Wonderful like and, and all that's really great and those are really fun, but it's not really getting into like the tools that we use to really prepare for that. So we did two things that I think were really, really key. And now basically anybody that I talk to that is thinking about going on the show or maybe wants to go on the show, I always tell them to do these two things, which is number one find individuals that were on the season that just aired. So yes, I was on season, I think it was like five or six of Shark Tank. So I was back on way in 2015. A lot changes between 2015 and 2022. So it's been seven years. There's been a lot of changes. I might have information that's no longer totally up to par with what's happening, probably still valuable, but not totally exact. So find someone who is on the season right before yours and reach out to them and try to get the full download. How did it work? What happened? What surprised you? What were you most unprepared for? Like, again, copy their homework, 
get as many notes as you can from these individuals. If you can try to find a warm intro to them, maybe a friend of a friend knows someone, or, you know, if you can try to access these people. So number one, try to talk to somebody who's on the season right before yours to see if they've, you know, added any little tricks that you need to watch out for. And number two, similarly, you need to watch every single episode, every single one of the season before yours and study it like you are going to war. <laughs> like you need to sit in front of a chess board and say like, okay, our men need to go here and we need to be ready. So what we did is we watched every single episode, every single one from the season before ours. And we, this is in the days before all of these fun things like Notion and uh, Evernote and HubSpot and all these like cool programs. We used Excel. This was like back in the day. We got an Excel and we wrote down every single question that the judges asked. And what we realized is that there were patterns. There were, there were questions that were being asked over and over again, from episode to episode, from, from company to company. What we did is that Excel had, I think it was like 113 questions by the time we watched the entire, all of the episodes before ours. Then what we did is we sorted those by what got asked the most frequently. From there, we came up with canned, if you will, answers to at least the top 40. Really, we came up with general answers for everything, but really memorizing those top 40 because we knew statistically speaking, we would be most likely to be asked those questions. So sometimes when you go on reality shows or you see uh, people that look surprised or like, oh, I wasn't ready for that question. That was not going to happen to us. It did not happen to us because we did our homework and we figured out exactly the type of questions that we most likely realized they were going to be asking us. And your pitch succeeded, right? With all that prep? <laughs> it definitely did. It was really one of those things that I look back on now and it's such the gift that keeps on giving. Most people don't realize that a lot of these channels like MSNBC, for example, will still run Shark Tank marathons. If you're ever up at like two in the morning and you turn on a MSNBC, there's a good chance it's, it's Shark Tank. And so our episode re-airs usually about every two to four months. So we'll see a big spike on the website or I'll see a big spike in people Googling me or my name. And I know, oh, well, Dark Tank probably re-aired and that's why we're seeing that big jump. So even though we that episode came out, you know, seven years ago now, it's still getting us traffic and exposure and people that are learning about us for the first time. What was the fate of Zine Pack? Because I my sense is you're not still doing it, but that's interesting that if you've pivoted away from that part of your business or that product altogether, that it still is benefiting you to have been on the show. Yeah, I feel like it's one of those things now that we're no longer making, you know, zine packs in the form that was on the show, which were, you know, packages that were sold at Walmart and Target because they had CDs in them. And we don't even listen to CDs anymore. So that part of our business has kind of been retired and we're doing all sorts of new stuff now. But what I've realized, and, and it's also probably a really good business lesson, and I imagine is true for you as well, Jenny, is that after a while, it really is, it comes back to that fundamental truth that people, people do business with people and people fall in love with the people and people fall in love with the story. So it's like, yes, Kim was on Shark Tank with Zine Pack, but really it's Kim in general. You know, it's, it's the reason why you might work with somebody at one job not work with them for five years and then work with them again. Or, you know, I know for you who does a lot of like speaking in corporate events, you might do a speaking event for somebody in 2019, kind of never hear from them again. And all of a sudden in 2023, they want to bring you back and, and maybe they change jobs. So they hired you when they were at Kellogg, uh, but now they're at Johnson and Johnson. And they want to hire you for something totally different. So I think it's really a case of if you make an impression as a person, people will follow you, which is why I think platforms, 
you know, are really important for you to update because people are going to be Googling you whether you not. Speaking of Google and to what you just said, I have been so surprised and delighted. I re recently gave a talk at Google and some people in the post event feedback survey, they said, you were my trainer 16 years ago, because that's how long I started at Google in 2006. And I left in 11. And I still do a lot of work with them to this day. And then someone might have watched that talk and they reach out and they say, we worked together 16 years ago. And I just saw the recent talk you gave. And now my team would love to do something for free time and talk about the gift that keeps on giving. I had no idea when I was in my early 20s, starting at Google it was my second job out of school, training all these people who were new to the company. I just had no clue that those relationships would still circle back to this day in the craziest ways. It's it's very joyful. And that kind of to your thing with Shark Tank, I talk about being discoverable. Like we just have to turn our Bluetooth device on. And it, that's that's what I find motivating about content when it doesn't feel just like a hamster wheel. It's the part of being discoverable and knowing that then sparks of serendipity can launch at any time. And I just love that surprise of never quite knowing who's going to reach out and when for what. Well, and I love that you brought up this discoverability because we were talking offline earlier about content creation and specifically how many people, at least in the last couple of years, maybe compared to five, 10 years ago, have started to kind of get that little light bulb above their head and be like, aha, like I should start giving out tips and tricks and tactics and things that work and, and have started to maybe identify themselves, maybe not as sort of content creators, because you had referenced a, was it a research study showing the growth? Yes, we can put the link in the show notes. Signal Fire yes. did this creator economy market report. And I was referencing, I read this at the start of, gosh, maybe even in 2021, because I cite it in free time, the book. And I bet now it's just even more. I mean, some millions, like 50 million people identify as content creators, even if it's not their full-time job. And I think a small percentage, maybe even as low as three to 5%, but don't quote me, are able to earn a full-time living from it. Wow. But it, but it is, it's that discoverability and you never know who's reading and you never know who's listening. And a lot of times, I always tell people too, you will be shocked how many lurkers there are. <laughs> and by the way, I love lurkers. So I will just say like, this is no hate on the lurkers, but people will lurk on your stuff. They will not like it. They will not comment on it. They will not share it, but they're watching. And, and I've even found that in real life, sometimes like friends or acquaintances, like they'll slip up and they'll be like, oh yeah, Kim, well, you know, I saw your Halloween costume and I'll be like, how, how'd you see that? How'd you see what I was for Halloween? And then they'll kind of be like, oh, well, oh yeah. I mean, I, I think I saw it on Instagram or something, but I know I'm like, you didn't like it. You didn't say nice costume. You didn't comment on it, but you saw it. You're like lurking around. So I always say too, even if you're putting it out, you might not be getting like the comments or, or the likes or the love, but people, people are watching, people are noticing. Well, you, you bring, you make this point to the statement that people are watching that, I mean, I've heard you talk about how we're all part of the creator economy. It's not just the people we look to as influencers. And it's certainly true that when I first started out with blogging and even podcasting, it was not very accessible. So you really had to get over a lot of technical hurdles to participate. And then with the advent of social media, everybody feels a little bit of pressure to create and be visible and be on LinkedIn or pick a platform of your choice, Instagram, TikTok. There's so many options now. So in what ways do you think, like, are we all creators? Are we all part of the creator economy? Is it even possible to opt out? And if not, how do we manage the overwhelm that comes with that pressure to be in all the places? Uh, unfortunately for us, we can't opt out. <laughs> Sometimes I wish we could, but we can't. And the example that I give people the most often is I uh, don't, I loved fax machines, thought they were brilliant. I loved Blockbuster, loved Blockbuster, had my little blue Blockbuster card, but now we have email 
And now we have Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime. So, so you can hold on to the fax machines and you can hold on to Blockbuster with two hands really gripping. But, but the C, the current is moving us. Like it's moving us to email and it's moving us to Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime. And so we can, we can hold on and say, but I want first impressions to be in person. And I want people to judge me based off, you know, what they find out about me and my smarts. But unfortunately, these things, these phones, these, these the Google results, um, they're just kind of dragging us, whether we like it or not, because, you know, we're all guilty of it. Your kid gets a new teacher at school, you Google them. Your friend starts dating a new guy or a girl, you Google them. You know, you're setting up a meeting with somebody you've never met before, you're Googling them. So people are, people are going to be consuming you and your content or lack thereof or LinkedIn profile or lack thereof, um, whether you like it or not. It's sort of like this necessary evil. It's no longer a nice to have. It's sort of a mandatory to have. And I'm sad about that, but it's true. So then if that's true, because, okay, here, here's the, the part. I, I call myself a cranky curmudgeon. Maybe that's redundant. I'm a curmudgeon about a lot of this stuff. I, as I mentioned, I do the podcast and newsletter and my books. That's that's about it, but I'm not on other social media. Are we at the whims just because a new social media company invents itself? Do we, are we at the whims? So it's like, oh, great. First there's Facebook. Now there's Instagram. Then LinkedIn becomes more prominent in terms of sending out snippets and then TikTok. And now TikTok's the hot thing. How do you participate without feeling a, like you're just chasing a bunch of shiny objects, but B, it's almost impossible to keep up just because someone else invents a company. Does that mean we have to now allocate more time and attention to it? I definitely don't think so. And what I, the, the kind of golden rule that I live by, and I tell other people this too, is you got to fish where your fish are. So what I mean by that is, so me, for example, I'll use my marketing agency, Bread Ideas Only. Abby and I, my, my co-founder, we'll sit there and say, okay, who are the people that are hiring us? Well, the people that are hiring us are brand managers, they're marketing directors. So then we say, okay, well, where are those fish? What pond, if you will, with this analogy, where are those fish hanging out? And for us, a lot of that is LinkedIn. It's a business network. It's something that these CMOs and brand managers, they're logging into every day to get their industry news or network with people. So for us, that platform is a little bit more important than, let's say, a consumer focused platform like TikTok. You know, we're not getting hired off TikTok just for us, for our business. Now, if you own a cupcake business and you're looking for people to buy cupcakes, well, it might be the total opposite. You might have 10,000 TikTok users that are all going to get your cupcakes shipped to their house. Whereas on LinkedIn, you know, if corporate cupcakes aren't exactly your, your bread and butter, that might not be the place for you. So I always say fish where your fish are. So like one thing that I love that I think you do so well, Jenny, is the people that are hiring you through the book, you get a lot of corporate speaking events, a lot of workshops, a lot of teams that are bringing you in. So to me, it makes sense that your website is super robust. You have a lot of information on your website. You have, you know, media kits and examples of how to contact you for these workshops and speaking events. And that to me makes sense because somebody reads the book or they hear about you, they Google you and they end up on your website. And then they're like, oh, I, you know, I can bring her into my conference or I can bring her into my organization. So, so for that, it's like, well, that's where, that's where they're going to end up. So I think that it's really important for everyone to really kind of sit and consider who are my fish and, and what pond are they in? I you love know? that. I love that. What pond are your people swimming in? Yes. And then I yeah. would also, I would also ask, so yeah, go, fish where your, where your people are. Like, that's just so brilliant. You said it even better. You said, you got to fish where your fish are. <laughs> yeah. You got to fish say, where your fish are you got to fish with tools or a fishing rod that fits like that 
the weight is just perfect. The functionality works for you. So I also think the implement that we use, maybe someone's using some kind of net. I mean, ideally we're being even kind to all these fishes and we're not killing too many of them, but we all have different strengths and different ways we like to go about it. And so I do think matching, it's like once you find the pond, okay, now that's where we get back to process. And like for me, I just don't like creating small daily snippets. I really don't like that yeah. at all. I'd rather go all in on a book. And even though my books only come yeah. out every five or six years, that fits my personality so much better. Well, and I'm glad that David brought this up because I know we had talked about as we wrap up here, really giving some of these tools and copy my homework and stuff that we're using. So I'm curious for you, Jenny, you know, David's asking about best resources. What are you using? What, what apps or tricks or, you know, platforms or software are you like, yes, this has been my new favorite thing? Well, Sometimes people ask me because I've been sharing, just like Kim, I share tools. I, I recommend at least two tools a week for the last 10 years. I like following other curators. So Tim Ferriss, he has Five Bullet Friday. My friend Sarah Young, her website is zincollaborative.com. She sends Friday favorites. The What is a great newsletter. The What is always curating really interesting things. Kim, our one and only Kim Kaup, is always curating interesting things and people. So I find that curation is a real gift, even if your role as a content creator in this world that we're living in is as is curation, that is performing a service for people because you're helping pull the signal out of the noise. And I always feel good when I'm sharing tips and tools that I know are going to help other people. So following curators, even if I can't keep up with all their stuff, it's there and I can search it or things cross my path at the perfect moment in time. And at a meta level, that helps me then curate from the curation, you know, curate what I think my fish, my people are going to benefit from most. I, I love that. And David, hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight or, or some things that you can maybe do or people or newsletters that you can sign up for because I think that's pretty great. And, and I, I would also read. say, go ahead. Go, oh, yeah, yeah, go. I was going to say, I, I read, I give myself permission to read for two hours every morning. <laughs> some people ask mm. me, how do I read so many books? Because I'll read one to two books a week. Sometimes I listen to like f at least five podcasts a day on two X <laughs> or maybe 1.8. But the bottom line is because I see myself as like, I want to feed my mind. That is the engine behind my business, behind my thought leadership, behind having not just regurgitating other people and curating other people's ideas, but actually coming up with my own. So the permission to read two hours in the morning, I read the New York Times paper edition, inky edition, the New Yorker, Monocle magazine. I don't mind setting that time aside books to just consume content. And I see that as part of my work. And that helps me drop the guilt. Should I be answering email right now? No, because feeding my mind is the engine that drives everything else, whereas the email is more of a reactive responsibility. Well, and I feel like I'm with Jeff. Wow, two hours a day for reading. <laughs> no wonder you finished so many books, Jenny. Um, but as you talked about listening to podcasts at 2x speed, are there certain podcasts that are you know, your favorites that you're listening to all the time? I'm one of these I probably subscribe to over 300 shows. There's no way I can listen to that many, but it, it goes in waves. There's really too many good ones to even say right now. I'll have to think of which ones come top of mind. Do you have any favorites, Kim, that are your go-to part of your routine? Um, I have a couple. I mean, Tim Ferriss, always yes. a good one. It's sort For of sure. one of those that it's, I don't listen to everyone I sort of like pick and choose because I don't know if anyone else has noticed Tim's have gotten really long lately, like two and a half hours long. And so sometimes I don't have time for all that. So I will kind of be discerning and I, I will, I'll give you a little tip that I learned about podcasts. Um, because again, as that like people pleaser, gold star, a student in me, as Jen would say, although she's not here with us, I'm an Enneagram three as I love to complete things. 
I love to check things off. And it was actually my husband who really kind of drilled this into me. And he said, it's okay to abandon ship. Because sometimes I would like muscle my way through a book or muscle my way through a podcast, even if I wasn't enjoying it, even if I wasn't learning. And his whole point is like, you know, cut bait, go, go, go to a book that you are going to learn from, go from a podcast you are, don't just finish it for the sake of finishing it. Like no one's giving you a gold star. No one's giving you a medal because you finished a two and a half hour Tim Ferriss podcast that you didn't find interesting. Like if after 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 20 minutes, you're not fully engaged, it's okay. It's, you know, it's okay to abandon ship. So that has kind of won me back a lot of time to then reallocate and resource to other things that maybe are more my fancy. So I would give that little podcast tip to anybody who's a big podcast fan, but, but I know we're getting to the top of the hour. So I wanted to say, Jenny, where can people keep like learning from you? I know you referenced two newsletters, two podcasts. Can you give us like the names of those where people can sign up for them? I want to make sure that everybody knows where to go to find that stuff. Sure. Well, this has been so fun. I just love trading tips and tools going back and forth and everyone who's been here with us live. You can visit itsfreetime.com for all things free time, pivotmethod.com for all things pivot. And in your podcast app, if you search for my name, Jenny Blake, thankfully I don't have a zillion doppelgangers yet <laughs> the way I do in other places. If you search Jenny Blake, you'll find both shows, free time and the other one's called Pivot. Ah, oh, I love it. This has been so fun. I'm so glad that you came up with this idea. I'm so glad you had the time and energy to space to do it with me because this was really fun. I would encourage everyone to listen. We're, we're, we're doing this in real time. So let us know in the comments, like, was this good? Was this bad? Or if you don't want to do it in the comments, you can write me a message or write Jenny a message and be like, here's what you need to improve. Or here's what I really liked because this was super fun. And I feel like we need to do this more often. I really enjoyed it. I second that. You have such a gift for facilitation. Thank you for having me. And it's just so fun to be here having virtual coffee with all of you live. So thank you, Kim. Thanks for having me back. I love it. This has been so fun. Thank you, everybody. Gracie, Kelly, Amu, Jeff, who've been hanging on and having fun in the chat and joining us live. This has been amazing. I will see everybody next Wednesday at 1 p.m., same time, same place. We are going to be on with my friend Jess Ekstrom. She is the founder of Headbands for Hope, and she is also introducing her second book. I know she already has one book, and she's going for number two. So we're going to be diving in. It is a book geared at teens and children all about entrepreneurship and really becoming a self-starter. So I'm really excited for that chat next week. But thank you so much for being here. And I look forward to seeing all of you. And Jenny, again, another big thank you. We so appreciate it. Likewise. Thank you, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.